Excellent. <laughs> All right. It seems we're live. So welcome everyone, everyone to the uh, Ubuntu Development Hangout. Today I'm joined by somebody very special. It's uh, Rick Spencer, <laughs> the Vice President of Ubuntu Engineering at, at Canonical. And before we start, if you um, if you're on Ubuntu on air.com, if you joined in to, to this video, please uh, please use the chat widget below the video where you can sign into the chat into ISC, which is what we use for general discussions. And then you can ask all your questions there. It's going to be much more interesting if you if you get involved and uh, ask whatever is on your mind. Um, so yeah. Um, so Rick, uh, you've been working at Canonical for, for how long now? A bit more than four years. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you started off at, as, as the manager of, of the desktop team. What are you working on nowadays? Can you try to explain what, what your job is about? Sure. Um, so I'm the uh, vice president of engineering for Ubuntu. Um, this means that Canonical pays me to lead all the people, all the other engineering managers, all the engineers, all the community, um, all the community staff, etc., um, to um, they, you know, I'm, I'm responsible basically to to guide how Canonical invests those resources into the project. So um, making sure that we're we have good plans looking down, you know, good engineering plans looking down the line a year or two, uh, making sure that we're working uh, the, you know, the right balance on the current version versus working on our build infrastructure versus working on things that maybe won't come to fruition for a year or two. So spend a lot of time on the phone, a lot of time writing, writing emails. Uh, a lot of times steering, so it's really it's really a great job. It's a serious privilege because um, recently the um, they recently Jane Silver, our CEO, and Mark Shuttleworth added the uh, the client upstream development to Ubuntu Engineering. So mm -hmm. that means as of very recently, we're on the same team with all the people who make Unity and all the all those client bits. So that it's been a lot of work. Uh, to sort of put those teams next to each other a little more and integrate how we work together. Now, at the same time, Robbie Williamson split off the server-focused parts. So Ubuntu still, Ubuntu engineering still makes the kernel. We do security. We do foundations, all that stuff for the server. But we don't actually roll the server, um, and especially not the cloud bits. There's a now a separate team that uh, sits next to us that owns the server. So there's a bit of a client server split now or client cloud split really, but we do, you know, we we run all the build infrastructure and everything for the server team. So that's sort of my, that's my scope, I guess. And, and it's a blast. Like I, there's so many incredible people that I get to work with within Canonical and then uh, so many people in the community who do just like really cool, interesting things that I, I never would have gotten to know or or work with. So it's been awesome. nice. It's been good. Good four years so far. Did, did you ever count how many calls you have during the week? No, I don't. <laughs> I don't look at that. I live in a Seattle, which is actually really inconvenient for my job. It turns out. Um, I didn't realize how inconvenient it was until last year when I lived in France, and it was like way easier to stay in touch with people. So in France, I could have like a block in the morning that was mostly Europe and Australia, and then a block in the evening which was mostly Europe and America. Now, like I have to, I get up at six, and it's already like the afternoon in Europe, and uh, it. I don't know. It's just so I tend to like it's seven o five right now, and I've already been working for an hour. I tend to, I tend to have just solid calls up from like six or seven until noon and then I take a two-hour break and then at starting at two then it's like I have more time to write and think and steer because all the Europeans are in bed but of course if I want to talk to you 
you know, I have to wait until 6 a.m. the next day and hope I don't have calls scheduled. Yeah. No, that makes 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 a lot of sense. So everyone is excited about um, 13 or 4, our next release, the Rare Ring Ringtail. Can you can you yeah, tell us what? Yeah, my ringtail shirt. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> can you tell us what what for, for you are the most interesting points in the thirteen or four plans? What's what's coming up? Oh, okay. Well, we only have an hour though, <laughs> but I'll <laughs> try. <laughs> okay. Well, actually, I'd like to answer that question by talk starting to talk about fourteen oh four. Like okay. one thing that's been really neat about the last year is that we've gotten sort of we've broken out of the six month to six month tape loop and we've been able to start thinking more like LTS to LTS, you know, um, and steering that better. So looking forward to 1404, we have a pretty strong vision for what we want 1404 to look like. So one thing about, and then after I explain that, then I'll back up and explain how 1304 is. Like getting us there. So cool. the first thing is we see like in 1404 that Ubuntu is going to power everything. So like we want it to be so like you'll have Ubuntu on your phone, you'll have it on your tablet, you'll have it on your netbook, your laptop, your de your workstation. It'll be powering your servers. It'll be powering instances on your servers that provide workloads to cloud deployments. Um, and we actually have a lot of that capability already, believe it or not, but um, we, we, by 14.04 we hope to like have that perfected and this is really potent because that means like as a user or as a customer or as an OEM you'll have like the same engineering practices across all those devices and then like if we update the kernel in one place for instance everything will get it. If you're like right in if you run an application, the same application will run in, on all those different, all, in all those different contexts, and that like unification, I think, will bring like a lot of interesting user experiences. So it'll like sort of like change the nature of the devices that you have because of that convergence, you know. So like your phone can be a TV, your phone can be a desktop. Um, so, uh, so we're shooting for that by 1404. Um, then the other, the next thing is that we've been investing a lot in quality, and by 1404, we want Ubuntu and all those contexts to be absolutely bulletproof, and that this has been a major, major focus for us within Canonical. Uh, there's a lot of invisible work that's going on behind the scenes to get our uh, QA capabilities going. And I can dive a little more into that later if people are interested. Um, the third thing about 1404 is we want to see that it, the OS is like keeping up with users. So um, when when Ubuntu was first released, it got updated every six months uh, and then got frozen in time. So you could like get a release, use it for 18 months, and then update, get a release, use it for 18 months. And that was actually really innovative at the time because you were getting fresh content every six months and you're, you weren't like forced to upgrade or forced to deal with changes until the, uh, that particular release that you were using was end of life, typically 18 months. Um, but things have a bit changed now and users expect, like they still want that base OS to stay pretty consistent you know, they don't want to get their workflow broken, they don't, you know, they would, they prefer the bugs that they know versus new bugs, but they expect the applications to change, like they expect to get new applications, they expect the applications to be updated. Similarly, application developers have the same expectation, like they expect to be able to just connect directly with, with their customers now through some kind of store or or whatever, and so um, so we want by 14.04 to finish the work that we've started to help the, um, help the OS keep up with end users in that way. And then the last one is sort of this internal perspective that like as the community of developers who make Ubuntu, we want it to be super efficient to make releases so that when we release it, it's, it's really fun to release. 
it's like we have a lot of confidence because of our QA processes that the release is going to go smoothly. You know, we like to have it so like if if you have like a stable release update today, you know that users are going to have it tomorrow, and you know that they they it was successful. You don't have that hair raising feeling that I'm going to release something that's going to potentially break everyone. So those are the four sort of long term. Um, pieces that we've been looking at and investing in uh, planning wise. So making a OS that powers anything, have the highest quality OS available, let the OS keep up with users and application developers, and then make releases super efficient. So I'm happy to talk about the work that we're doing in 13.04 for each of those, but I don't know how much how interesting that is for for folks. Yeah, well, we can, we can, uh, there are a couple of questions coming in. Um, I'm going okay. to, I'm going to queue them up for, for later on. Um, so you sort of answered, answered my next question already, because if I'm looking back over the, the last releases, um, I can't think of one where we didn't say, so this release is going to be the most important one for Ubuntu. Um, why would you yeah. say that's the case for for thirteen oh four? It's 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 on the road for fourteen oh four and yeah. Well, so I think um from a like user facing direction, I think mm -hmm. that thirteen oh four will be like a natural evolution. Like we'll have things like the hundred scopes project that'll make the dash like much more useful. Like it'll um, but I think the reason that it's going to be important that we'll look back on 13.04 as a as the critical release will be because it'll it's the one where we snapped our QA processes and our release processes into line. So like we'll have like by the end of 13.04 we should have like a, a significant body of autopilot tests. Mm -hmm. So, for instance, we made a change in 13.04 already. Colin Watson made it so that when you a developer uploads a package, the package doesn't get built and go right into the release pocket for 13.04. It goes into what's called proposed, which is which nobody runs, but proposed is a different archive. But then we can run a bunch of tests on that archive and make sure everything is really good before it gets moved over into the release pocket. Well, so we have that infrastructure, but we don't have that many tests. So by the end of 13.04, I think we'll look back and say, can you believe that we used to release right into the release pocket without running all these tests? And that we used to take packages without tests to run, and we used to... So I, I think uh, that's an example of how we'll look back at this release as the beginning of that... Um, making a bulletproof OS uh, theme that I was talking about. And uh, I think the developers are enjoying that too. Like that, that, um, that system I think is like catching problems. It's keeping Ubuntu very, very stable every day. So like it keeps it, you never get into circumstances now where like only X, half of X gets installed if you're running the development release. Um, so a lot more people are running the development release, which means that we're fun getting a lot more feedback. And so I think we'll look back on it from more how we build it than what what was in it. Does that make sense, Daniel? Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, I think it's going to be really interesting if somebody at some stage, like maybe in 20 years, is going to write the, the history of Ubuntu, uh, because I still remember the first release where Sebastian Bachet, he he uploaded the, the last GNOME packages just half an hour before we released. And <laughs> today things are very, very different. And I and and I love these these auto package tests, autopilot tests, all this infrastructure. It's going to make a huge change. Yeah. That's funny that you mentioned Sebastian, because he of course you know, I love that guy like a brother. He really <laughs> I he was on the desktop team. Uh, when I was on the desktop team, and he still is, and I just I learned so much from him about Ubuntu, but also about like teamwork and friendship and all that kind of stuff. Um, he is one of the strongest proponents of daily quality. So like, yeah, I can believe that he was uploading packages at the last minute, but he does not <laughs> think that way. You know, he's no. <laughs> <laughs> he wants Ubuntu to be very, very, very good, and he's he he doesn't like to take risks that might impact end users. Absolutely. 
All right, let me see. We have a number of questions. Let me scroll back to the first one. So, a um, user with the name app get install asks, <laughs> will the search results from Amazon be disabled by default in 13.04? No. Good question. Um, so, if the... The dash... So, so he's... No. So the dash is undergoing a lot of change, and the uh, 1210 dash was sort of like on, on the way there. So what the dash is going to be converging m as successive versions go by, more and more search results together. And it'll be smart to know, like, you know, which tend to be better links. So we actually have a project called 100 Scopes in 1304, which is to, well, port all the scopes that different people have written and install them by default in Ubuntu. So not only will the Amazon results not be disabled by default, but there'll probably be Reddit results, there'll be Ask Ubuntu results, there'll be the book scope, like all those community developed scopes out there, um, they're going to get cleaned up and installed by default. So by 1404, you'll be getting a uh, really rich collection. This tests really, really well. Like what users like in the like in the user testing just really have loved just putting in one search term in one place. Like so there's always just one place to go, one place to search, and then getting um, getting interesting results from all, all kinds of places. So that's the path that the dash is going to evolve down. Um, now of course, we understand not everyone wants to search online. Even though, I mean, the Dash is inherently an online search tool. That's like, you know, that that it's always searched online. It's always for on the video lens, on the um, uh, on the music lens. So I think you expect to see it like get simpler. Expect to see more results converge, but expect to see those results get like smarter, like you know, ranking algorithms that can drive you better results. Yeah, so. I myself, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about it. But as you said, I can imagine that if you, that it wasn't wasn't obvious enough in the beginning that it searched online. But uh, there always were the Ask Ubuntu lenses, uh, Wikipedia, and, and all these other lenses, which are great tools, and I love using them. So I guess that's probably where, where the question yeah. came from. I think the big mistake was that we um, we landed it really late, and there there wasn't really a discussion to get feedback and talk it over and stuff. So that those kind of like late non-transparent landings, um, they're they cause all different all kinds of different communication problems, just like like this That's one right. did. So and it's evolving. We we're, we're improving things. So. That's good. Yeah. All right. Next one. Uh, B. Curtis W. X. asks: Does the Valve work going on mix with the work you are doing uh, or your team is doing? Valve, the game company. Yep. Yeah. Uh, does it mix with it? Well, hmm. I'm not sure what work work he's talking about. So I can just talk a little bit about how we're working mm -hmm. with Valve a bit. So um, Bryce Harrington on the desktop team is actually taking the lead on the engineering for it. Of course, there's like, you know, they're going to be selling stuff, so there's some commercial discussions to be had, but that's not really right. in our domain. So um, so Bryce Harrington is taking the lead on that, and so he's, like, synced up with them on what are the um, sort of the technical challenges that they face. So I actually went and visited those guys in the office, and I was like really deeply impressed. So first of all, they have really good values that I think are really harmonious with Ubuntu, and they really believe in open platforms. They also um, they don't believe in a zero sum game. Like they feel like making Ubuntu like a good gaming platform, other people will take advantage of it, and that's just fine. You know, so they're willing to invest in Ubuntu, which is great for us, um, and smart for them I think. So Bryce like 
you know, sort of broke down some of the things that they have uh, have had historical difficulties with, like the way that we release binary drivers. Uh, sometimes games are dependent on like cutting edge drivers, and so like he Bryce put a lot of work into talking to the tech board about how to get users those drivers. There's just some not really bugs, but just some aspects of the system that that made it not ideal for uh, gaming, and so we've been uh, working on those. Like some people might know about this indirection. The encompass. So Compass is a compositor, which means it like paints everything in a secret place and then paints it to the screen after it's all composited together. But that act of painting it over here and then painting it onto your screen turned out to slow games down just like a little bit. But gamers like a little bit is they don't like even a little bit. So um, getting that fixed, getting that fixed back ported to 1204. So we're doing a lot of work actually that Bryce is leading to ensure that the engineering work that Valve does really, really shines um, on the desktop. Because this Steam has been one of the top requests that I've gotten from users um, and continue to be part of the community. Awesome. All right, let me see what's the next one. Um, people have been talking so much. Uh, okay. Yeah, here's, here's another one. Uh, will 1304 have the new Valve optimized NVIDIA drivers available? Oh. Um, yes. Okay. <laughs> so Bryce is making sure that all the Valve, whatever drivers the Valve games need, those drivers will be available. Perfect. There's another question from Hekwa. Um, how will 1304 work on Windows 8 systems with UEFI? Ooh. <sighs> so so um, it'll work. It'll install just fine. It'll run just fine. So I think what he's referring to is something called Secure Boot, mm -hmm. which... Um, the idea of Secure Boot is that um, it's a system for ensuring that nobody inserts evil code into your boot process before your, well, basically before your kernel boots, right? So, like, um, this does, brings a lot of security benefits to end users. So we, uh, Steve Langasek and Colin Watson have put it, invested a lot of work to ensuring that we can install and run on secure boot machines. So in fact 1210 installs fine on um, machines with UEFI. Wow. And we use Grub2 so it's pretty much the same the same experience. There's sometimes like you're more likely to see like things printed out to the screen on UEFI, mm -hmm. but um, it's pretty much the same experience. So we basically have um, there's a bootloader which is called Grub. Well, Grub Two is what we use, and then there's something that loads that bootloader, which we get signed by Microsoft, and then we sign Grub Two. And these guys, the bootloader, we call it the bootloader shim, the bootloader mm -hmm. loader, make sure that the bootloader itself is signed. And so in that way, up to the bootloader, there's a chain of trust. And the reason we did that is because the bootloader shim is a very small piece of software that we get signed by Microsoft, which shouldn't need to change very much. Mm -hmm. And in that way, if we need to update Grub2, we can just sign Grub2 and give an update without having to go back to Microsoft and get the bootloader loader signed. Again. Yep. So it's been a tremendous amount of effort to make it transparent so it should be transparent. If, of course if you buy it pre-installed on UEFI machine it should um, should work as well. Now that said you can actually disable secure boot if it's not a feature that you want. So you can run anything like part of the Windows 8 spec is that you can run um, that you can disable secure boot. So if you want to run another distro or if you want to compile your own Ubuntu like let's say you know you want your own Grub too, um, you can just disable Secure Boot, take that security risk, which of course everybody does until now. Like there's not that many UEFI machines in the wild yet. Right. Um, 
Now, one caveat is that the system requires that the OEM has installed a special key called a uh, UEFI driver key. Mm -hmm. So there's the main, um, if you buy a computer with Windows 8, it should have two keys on it. One is to boot Windows, but one is to also validate that third-party drivers have been signed. Um, we've seen one or two cases where that second key, the OEM didn't realize that they needed that. And so if that's not there, then in the, in the very rare case that that's not there, then you'll have to disable secure boot to install Ubuntu at all. But I think that those cases will go, go away because that's terrible for the OEM because the user can't, yeah. even if they're running Windows, they can't buy a, you know, external hard drive with its own driver. It won't, oh. you know. So, so those cases should go away. Anyway. Well, I just learned something new myself. I didn't deal with UFI at all up until now. <laughs> that was a long way of saying that you shouldn't notice any difference. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. So Joe asks, when you say Ubuntu on the phone, do you mean as a sort of dual boot solution, or will one be able to use the phone as a phone to make calls and take photos and so on? I mean both. So by 1404, we want to have a, and we've said this a few times, we just want to have Ubuntu on the phone, so just running natively on the phone. Um, so we'd like to offer phone manufacturers an alternative to Windows Phone Edition and Android. And we'd like to offer them like a really truly, you know, open source community distro that they can install there. Um, uh, so that's like very much part of the, the, um, the vision for 14.04 is that we have like a credible phone OS. And we've actually started in 13.04 we're working on that a little bit with the Nexus 7. So mm -hmm. we chose the Nexus 7. It's a tablet platform to run Ubuntu, just the desktop. We're not changing the experience at all. So you needed mouse and a keyboard connected to your Nexus 7. But we're working to make it boot fast, to make it run fast, to make it like all the things that you need for a ARM, you know, well, a lower powered chip you know, lower power video card where you are very sensitive to battery life. Like, so we just like the core of Ubuntu, tune it to run really well on the Nexus 7. So that's like the, the work that we're doing with the community in 1304 towards that. So that's yes, number one. We definitely want by 1404, it's natively powering a phone. The second question is about um, sort of dual boot. And he, I think he might be referring to something called Ubuntu for Android, which is a um, product that we also would uh, would like to offer to OEMs. And the idea here, um, and you can see all the videos on it and, and everything if you want to go look for Ubuntu for Android. The idea here is that you, you're carrying around your Android phone, do to do making calls, surfing the web on the bus, all that stuff, and then you dock it, and then it runs Ubuntu off that running instance of Android. So it uses the same kernel, but the Ubuntu user space basically comes up, projects on your screen, and interacts with the data on your phone. So imagine you're surfing the web, or imagine you're, you're reading your email, um, maybe on Gmail or something, and you're on the bus, doo 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 you get into work, of course you pour a cup of coffee, chat with your friends, sit down at your desk, plug your phone into some cradle that provides power to power at the battery, but also connects it to a monitor, keyboard, mouse, and then Ubuntu says, oh, I see on Android you are looking at this at your Gmail. Here, let me show you your Gmail in Firefox on your desktop in Unity. Um, you know, uh, I see that there's, you know, new songs that you added on Android. Let, let me play those for you in, in rhythm box, et cetera, et cetera. So um, that's what we call the convergence story, like where um, the, the phones are getting as powerful as desktops were when we first started making Ubuntu. Yeah. So, um, so the answer is both. And I can't wait for, for both. It's going to be good times. If I may, I would like to say a few things about the Nexus 7 because I'm 
partly involved with it as well. So if you have Please an X7, seven, if you're interested in um, helping us out, get it, getting getting everything um, going. Please have a look at wikiubuntucom slash nexus 7 and there are instructions for, for installing an Ubuntu image on it and um, we're going to, to need some help. Like you can test Ubuntu and from my personal experience I can say it's running surprisingly well. We have clear fonts, the Unity story. Uh, it really surprised me how well this all works on a, on a small tablet. But what we want to work on is, as Rick said, uh, memory consumption, power consumption. That stuff we we have to 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 figure out, and um, we're we're running some programs this cycle where you can get involved with it. And the great thing is, it's not only the Nexus Seven or other devices which are going to benefit from it, but your general desktop and the server, everything is is going to benefit from from these changes. So, if you're interested, if you have some experience there, please get involved. Okay, I'm I'm sure. After you talked about this, there's going to be a couple more questions about the phone. Let me see what else we have in the queue. Uh, Veslabs asks, will ATI release an official driver for the new kernel that Ubuntu 12.10 and later use? I don't know. Sorry. Well, I, I'm not, I haven't been tracking ATI for a couple of years and, 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 and that. So um, I think Bryce Harrington is a good, guy, good person to ask that. Sorry. If, if you go in the uh, Ubuntu desktop channel, you can can just talk to the guys in there, and they should be able to, able to, to help you. All right. Uh, Tio asks, when will be Ubuntu Cloud OS access your desktop from a web page? Ooh. So I think what he's suggesting is that is a feature that I don't think we're really, as far as I know, no one's working on except for Edge of, Edge Ubuntu, where your um, like the desktop that you're running is actually powered by an instance of Ubuntu in the cloud and it's being streamed to your computer. Um, well no that's not true. We do have we've done a lot of work on thin clients. Um, so this Capability exists, but it's really designed for enterprise users. Like as far as what Canonical has been been supporting, you know. So you you notice in twelve ten on uh, in the light DM in the login greeter, you can actually give your credentials for a remote login, and you can actually log into Windows as well as Ubuntu that way. So this is really powerful for um, for enterprises like imagine like you have a thousand people with computers that you bought six years ago yeah your Windows XP license are running out and anyway it's all end of lifing do you buy like a thousand new computers so you can run Windows 8 or do you let them use those computers as thin clients to access their desktops remotely so that we have that capability actually in 1210 but that you sh d depending on what kind of organization you are, you might actually want to look at Ed 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 Ubuntu. This is a flavor of Ubuntu which really specializes in this scenario. So like what they're picturing is people like people in schools um, and educational environments who like have different needs for their computing resources. They don't necessarily need everything like persisted directly on their on uh, the on their on their computers because like, you know, people are going through the labs and you know, imagine there's a hundred people per computer basically. They just get slices of it during during the year. So the Edge Ubuntu folks have a server product that they make that, that like connects with the client. So I think I think the capability that this person's talking about actually already exists, but I don't think, um, I don't know if it's been productized like and really cleaned up, but it sounds like he's interested in it. I would suggest getting in touch with the Edge Ubuntu community and um, seeing where that stands, or if he's a, like a IT manager working in a company, maybe um, get in touch with Canonical support and see 
what the status is. So I don't really quite know the specific status of the thin client um, situation. But yeah, it, it sounds like the, the, the basic pieces, they're all there, which is, which is fantastic. So we have a user, uh, Chirot, uh, seems to have made the observation that a couple of his friends uh, moved from Ubuntu to Xubuntu, and um, he believes it's because of the Unity graphic interface. What do you, what do you think about that? Did, did you make similar ob observations? That not everyone uses stock Ubuntu? Yeah, that, it, that um, at least some people were surprised somehow. Well, yeah, so we knew, so I knew when we switched to Unity, so we switched to Unity by default in 11.04, I think. I think that was the release. Yeah. I think it was available in 10.10, default in 11.04. Um, maybe I, maybe it was all six months later, but I think that, that was right. So yeah. we knew switching to Unity would be you know, controversial, and it's just whenever you do anything new, it's not universally beloved. You know, it's, it's a, uh, not everyone wants to give up what they had before, but we knew we had to do something new, though. GNOME is just not, GNOME as a GUI was not keeping up. Um, it was definitely not delivering the, that delicious user experience that users that computer users expect, you know, so, and it didn't look like it was going to, and remember this is like before GNOME Shell started, and and uh, uh, and then when GNOME Shell started, it started off slow, they, you know, um, uh, so we knew that, you know, we knew that there'd be a strong reaction to it, there was a strong reaction to it. I personally love Unity, you know. I mean, I've been, like, involved in it since the beginning. Uh, um, since, yeah, actually, Unity actually started out as something called the Netbook Remix. Um, that, that, um, that GUI. So, was not surprised to see people opt for other desktops. But you know what? They, they always have. Like, we've always had flavors. And the flavors are a very important part of the Ubuntu community. And the thing about the Ubuntu community is that the flavors allow people to pursue their interests, like in Zubuntu, Edge Ubuntu, Kubuntu. They can pursue their interests within the framework of the archive, right? So they don't have to go and make a fork you know, unless they're trying to make a commercial competitor product like Mint, they don't have to take the code away, build it somewhere else. So uh, someone using Ubuntu, they're still really using Ubuntu. And, um, you know, we actually continue to invest in the, the flavors. We had a lot of discussions with the flavors at the last UDS in Copenhagen because, you know, we're... we're conscious that we want them to be successful and we want to make sure that we have release processes and a release cadence um, and all this that that actually helps them. So um, I guess I'd say not surprised, happy that he's using Zubuntu, like we love the flavors community and power to, power to you. But I personally love Unity, it just it works really perfectly for me and, and I probably use Ubuntu as much as anyone in the world, so yeah, and, and Unity has has come a long way. When I used it in the beginning, there were many bugs I run out. It's 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 faster, and um, and especially if you look at devices and, and see how it works there, and how you have like a consistent user interface, a consistent story across the devices. Uh, I love it too. Yeah, that's a good point. Like Unity, it was designed from the beginning to, you know give a familiar experience across all the different form factors that we're just now starting starting to make real. I mean, I do think it does have some words that we need to fix. I think, like, the dash is a bit too slow, for instance, and we need to make that, uh, we need to make that better. Um, I think uh, we got, the, the whole LLVM pipeline thing made things very difficult for us. Um, so um, basically what, what happened there was that we had two unities. 
One was made out of QML, and it was designed to run on computers without a fast graphics driver. Um, uh, and that worked, um, that worked okay for people who didn't have, you know, more recent graphics chips and graphics drivers. But then uh, cute, like Nokia dropped support for that and they just went to computers without graphic drivers, just used what's called LLVM pipeline, which is the CPU emulating the uh, a true graphics trip chip. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the, the are both versions of Unity became essentially the same. They had the same limitations, and so there were, we couldn't afford to build two things that did basically the same thing. So that's that's why we ended up with just the the 3D Unity because, by all intents and purposes, they all went through the same same channels, but. It's the challenge for us now is to make that same version of Unity work properly everywhere, and so we're we're in deep, deep thought and deep discussion about how to make that happen. Yeah, speaking of graphics and and and, and speed, uh, there's a question about Wayland. What's happening with Wayland? Well, Wayland. So Wayland is a like experimental display manager that. Um, supposedly in the future can replace X. And so um, we've been monitoring it. We've made it so you can, you know, install it and use it in Ubuntu. But it's, there's a lot of buzz and discussion about it, but it really doesn't do, any, doesn't do anything really useful, useful yet. So I do believe that in the fullness of time, Xorg is going to go away. I think X is very big and cumbersome. It fulfills a lot of requirements which people don't actually have. Um, it's very ginger. The code is, by ginger, I mean it's very temperamental. Like the code base is, <laughs> is complex. We need really smart people like Bryce and Chris Halls Rogers and um, uh, et cetera. Um, T.S. Eliot just, you know, like always having to dive in and tinker with it. It's hard to make drivers for, um, et cetera. So I, I, don't, I don't think that Xorg is going to be around forever. Um, I'm not sure Wayland's going to be the, the replacement for it just because it's not, it doesn't replace it yet. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, um, so we'll see. We'll see. I'm glad somebody's, you know, working on it and thinking about it. But. Totally. And if you have more questions about X and, and Wayland, maybe the guys in uh, Ubuntu X or Ubuntu Desktop can, uh, can help you out with them. We have another question. Uh, will the support for the LTS be longer than five years in the future? I will it be longer than five years. Wow. I don't think. I don't know. I don't think so. I mean, that five years seems like plenty of plenty to me, but I, I, I want to know why they're why why they are asking. It really things like seems like things are going the other way. That um, we're getting more pressure to provide updated software mm -hmm. and to move faster rather than to freeze things in time for longer. And you can see. Um, you can see evidence of this, for instance, on the cloud side. We set up the cloud archive, so you can have 1204, but you can run updated OpenStack, updated Juju. Like, like customers really and users really, really wanted that. Like, so I mean, like up running a future OpenStack on your current Ubuntu, like that's a major, like that's a huge piece of plumbing that you're running the latest and greatest on, but. Uh, um, people really, really wanted that capability. Um, and you can also see just in the application software world on the desktop, like, you know, people get really excited when a new piece of software comes out and et cetera. So I, um, I don't know, time will, time will tell, but there's certainly no plans right now to expand, extend, um, extend that period of time. Okay. Um, 
So somebody asked what the three top goals for Unity in 13.04 are. What are the three top goals for Unity? Yep. Jeez, I'm, I don't have a pat <laughs> answer for that. I can tell you what my goals for Unity are, but they're probably not, I don't know, there's probably other goals. So one of my goals for Unity is to have it be very easy for the developers to publish new branches into the development and release, like to have that go very quickly. We talked about this a lot at the last UDS. So say you're, you have a new branch, I want it to be that, like, you push some kind of button, within an hour you have feedback from the system that your branch was accepted, all the tests were run, they all passed, it's ready to go, and within 24 hours it's live in the development release, so then you can get feedback and other people can start building on it, and etc. So that's one of my goals. Um, one of my goals for Unity is to have it be um, instrumented so we can start taking performance measures and so that we can make, you know, make sure that we're improving performance of it in ways that matter and make sure that we don't regress when we win that, you know, so we'd like to see it that performance only gets, goes down, down is good because that means things are faster, like so performance only gets faster and never gets slower again, but we need to do some investment within the code base so that we can get that telemetry out of it to know that it's going fast. Um, and finally, um, I'd like to see a lot more unit tests in it so that developers get fewer regressions when they're writing to it. Um, and those would then turn into auto, pi auto package tests, which means those tests would get run before the developer, at least the developer's machine, but also before it leaves proposed into the development release. So if something changed that under Unity that broke it, that would get caught. And I'd like to see more autopilot tests. An autopilot is a tool that sort of drives the GUI and runs tests and you can do integration testing. So sometimes it's not Unity itself that breaks, but like, you know, we a new graphics driver gets installed. The Unity developers have nothing to do with it, but it turns out that that subtly changes the way GL works and in some area and that breaks Unity. I'd like to be able to catch those kinds of things before they end up in the development release. So for, I guess, to summarize, for me the top three goals are efficient landing, and Toph Didier is doing a really good job working with Popey and his team on that. Um, uh, the second one is performance inf instrumentation, and the third one is test, 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 and more tests. Yeah, I guess those would be my top three as well. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't care if the experience doesn't much change. If we make it faster and more robust, like I think that would be a great outcome. So. Awesome. So I don't know anything about the next one, but do you know if there will be better support for SLI 2X and SLI 4X, or is this an NVIDIA issue? I'm totally lost. The, um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, I can't answer that. I didn't really understand the, the, the question too well. It sounds, so, uh, that yeah, sounds like a good one for Bryce. Sorry. Yeah, Ubuntu X or Ubuntu Desktop, yeah. next one. Uh, would Ubuntu, especially Ubuntu Server Edition, add more killer enterprise solutions, such like RHEV? Um, I'm not sure exactly what RHEV is, but the answer is yes. Like. Ubuntu on the server is an amazing, amazing thing. Like, so it's it's really a truly, truly a cloud OS. So um, you can run it as the bread and butter server and install it under your desk or whatever. That's fine. But the focus of the product is really to be a cloud, like, which is really a modern way of running running servers, right? So Ubuntu itself then is a great cloud host. In other words, you can install Ubuntu on a set of computers, you can use a product called Maz, to which is metal as a service, to provision those computers really easily. So the idea is um, if you're setting up um, a c series of computers, you can use Maz, get them set up really easily, really fast, M-A-A-S. 
then you can use something called Juju, which Juju is an orchestration tool. So Juju knows about different kinds of workloads and different kinds of software, like the enterprise software that this person's referring to. And then you can use Juju to deploy OpenStack on to those computers that you just provisioned. So imagine you have a shop, you have five, five servers, you use Maz to set up those servers, and then you use Juju to, you say Juju deploy OpenStack, then those servers are now running OpenStack. OpenStack is a, provides a cloud for you, and then you can use Juju to, ins, to run workloads like he's talking about. So that, that assumes that they've been charmed, and charmed in a crude way is like packaging for the cloud. It um, allows you to do commands like Juju deploy blue mine, Juju deploy um, uh, I don't know what what's software that you want my new blog software, Juju deploy MySQL, Juju deploy Rails, Juju deploy Node.js, and then Juju will work with OpenStack then to install a virtual instance of Ubuntu that is running that workload. So you say Juju deploy MySQL. The beauty of it is that the charm has captured the expertise of the upstream. So like whoever knows best how to configure MySQL to run on Ubuntu, like that expertise will be captured in the charm. So if you look at what's called the charm store, you'll be able to see all the software that's been packaged like this. And like you can use Juju on Amazon Web Services, you can use Juju on all the all the public clouds. You'll even be able to run it on use it on Azure, which is Microsoft's cloud. So, um, uh, so the answer to the question is very, very much yes. Like, if you want to run enterprise software, if you want to run server software, if you want to um, orchestrate that software to work well together, Ubuntu is by far the most cutting edge and also the most solid, the most complete. It's just like by far the best solution for, for that. So it's really exciting. I think that's why we sort of moved the cloud team over so they could focus on that without like as much. So we don't have to make trade-offs between client and cloud now. They can just go pedal to the metal, make this awesome, amazing thing. So did, it, did, did that make sense? Was I able to describe that, Daniel? Absolutely, absolutely. OK. There was a follow-up question. Um, do you have plans to add enterprise features for servers out of the box? For example, could Ubuntu completely replace Windows Server and Exchange, etc.? Well, yeah. I mean, I give the same answer. Yeah. So yes, in the in the in the cloud. So I would expect you. Well, in truth, you can use Juju to target an individual computer. So if you want to run it in the traditional way, where it's just like a bare metal. A, Ubuntu instance, you can deploy into there as well using Juju. But I just don't think people are going to be doing that in a few years. So I think that um, I just I think we already we already have the most cutting edge open source software available in that way. And there's actually nothing to keep someone from charming proprietary software if they want to do that as well. You know, just like you can package with a Debian package format proprietary software. You can, I, I don't see why you couldn't do that with a charm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, we're, like, Ubuntu is in heavy, heavy use in enterprises. It's, um, you know, and if you look at statistics about what's running the web, there's more Ubuntu every day. So, I mean, it's, like, we're, we're, um, I think the thing is we've solved the problem after next. So if you like have like an old fashioned, if you're looking back and you want to do the same things that you've done in the past, like you can do that with Ubuntu just fine, but that's not really where we're investing. We're really investing in like looking to the future, like what's the really easy way, cost effective way, flexible way to um, to manage back office, to manage web servers to manage other kinds of servers and we think that that future is all cloud-based. Good answer. Um, 
the next question, I'm not sure how, how specifically we can answer this, but, but still, uh, what's Ubuntu's plan to get to tablet markets? What's our plan to get to tablet markets? Mm -hmm. um, well, I can just say by like 14.04, we expect that we'll like the same Ubuntu that runs on your desktop will run sweetly on a tablet. I don't know more specifically how I don't know more specifically like how we would engage OEMs and stuff. The device markets are a bit different because most of them run ARM chips which have a lot of proprietary like you know typically the graphics chip is mm -hmm. proprietary often the board itself has proprietary chips so like the it's not like Linux on your tried and true desktop or laptop which is Intel based system and the generic Linux upstream kernel runs just fine on it you have to do a lot of enablement for phones and for tablets typically so I'm not sure like ideally we'll be at a place where there's just like a general purpose this is the Ubuntu distro and it'll just install on your tablets and that's how we get to the market um, but I, I think um, they'll probably have to be a lot more co partnering with with um, OEMs and you know other companies to to be able to offer that for their specific tablets so no. we've actually done a lot of work on this in the past like we've always had an ARM edition for this reason, among many reasons, but you know, we've always made sure that we had that capability to make a a specific version of Ubuntu for some ARM device. It's been Panda board up till now. And also, what I I think what we said before that um, you have the same development experience if you hack on your desktop or if you work on on something for the tablet or for a phone in the future is always going to be the same. It's always going to feel the same, and I think that's that's also going to be very appealing. Yeah, and imagine if you're an OEM, like you have to learn, you know, you learn to turn the crank on like desktops, which they already know how, right? Like we, we work with all the top five OEMs now, then imagine like you want to come out with a tablet. Well, you already know how to do Ubuntu on the desktop. It's probably not exactly. that much of a stress to do Ubuntu on, on this tablet. So I, I, I'm hoping that there's some pull through there. But the exciting times, exciting times. But. <laughs> They are. Get a Nexus 7. They're open anyway, and you can always put the Android back on it. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, there's another Wayland question. We answered that already. Um, another one. Uh, what about folders, not quick list in, in Unity, like in iOS? There's a project called Drawers. I'm sorry. I think they're asking me about like some Mac features, but I don't know them, so I don't know, and I don't I don't, I do, I focus more on like how we build Ubuntu uh, than like what we're building. So I like in terms of like specific features coming up and stuff until they're like slated to go into a version of Ubuntu. I don't really know much about them. I'm sorry. Makes sense. So we have two minutes left. Um, is there anything you would like to, to, to say to our community, to our development community? Anything, any last words maybe? Hmm. Well, I guess I'd uh, like to say it's been, uh, it's been a really fun couple of releases. Like I really liked, um, I was really proud of 1204 and the way we pulled together to make the, the daily quality uh, work on that. Um, I'm really looking forward to working with the Unity team to help them hook them into the daily quality so that um, and to drive improvements there. So um, I think I guess I would say like if you are contributing to Ubuntu I think our focus on that rock solid stability is going to be like a really good opportunity to maybe find new ways to contribute. If you haven't contributed before because there's nothing that interests you or that matched your skills, I think things like the two week testing cadence where we do like a full manual test run with uh, the, our QA community every two weeks, that's like a great opportunity to contribute. Also make sure the next version of Ubuntu will run well on your hardware. Um, writing test plans, writing test cases, 
writing auto package tests, writing autopilot tests. I think all this that we're putting into place like in a serious way in 1304 is going to um, we're going to harvest benefits from that for years to come. So it's a really, really good time to contribute to something that's like new and exciting and, and very important. And I think it's very important for free software because the more we can make our upstream code bases better quality, that will actually rip to all free software, you know? So the better, you know, like if we're testing the GNOME tip, That'll make GNOME better. Other distros that use GNOME will get better. Same with LibreOffice. Same with the kernel. Same with OpenStack. Same with same with everything. So it's a really exciting time. I think we're going to look back at this as like a, a fulcrum, a you know something flipped over. And I think uh, I encourage everyone to contribute to it because it'll be good memories. Yeah, I agree. This is the the best times to get involved. This is really fantastic. So I would like to thank everyone who, who answered questions, who was who was involved in the session today. Sorry we didn't get through all the questions, but I promise you we're going to invite Rick again. And it was, was great having you. Thanks a lot for, for making time. Oh, yeah, no problem. Oh, by the way, I'm Rick Spencer 3, all one word, on Freenode. You can always, if I didn't get answer your question or I answered it wrong or whatever, <laughs> uh, feel free to find me. I'll be logging into IRC just right after this. So, awesome. Thanks, Daniel. Thanks again. Have a great All day. Bye-bye. Right. Take care, everyone. Bye.